everyone. It's great to have you here joining John and I. And we have two guests, Brennan and Shiv. First, I'd like to introduce myself, Carl Rosen, oculoplastics, neuro-ophthalmology, Anchorage, Alaska, for the past 30 years in beautiful Alaska. It's actually a very nice day today. John Ditkoff, a cornea specialist, my friend and partner on the channel. And John and I were co-residents together back at Albert Einstein years ago. John? Yeah, nice to see everyone. I'm in northern New Jersey. I've been in practice for 30 years. I do general ophthalmology specializing in cornea. And I'm very excited to hear if I remember anything from med school today. I want to hear about the life of a med student. So right. uh, take it away, Carl. Yeah. So we have two, two great guys here. We have Shiv and Brennan. And I'm just going to give a quick background. So Shiv went to Seton Hall and he's at Hackensack Meridian School uh, of Medicine. Right? Shiv went to Rutgers, right? Oh, Rutgers. Yeah, I was Rutgers. Shiv went uh, to Rutgers. All right, so uh, I blew it already, guys. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, which is a new med school, when I was applying, that wasn't in existence, but we we celebrate Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, and Shiv and Brennan are both first years. Uh, so. Brennan is a Seton Hall graduate. Yes, Got that right. Okay. And um, redeemed myself. And is also at Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, also a first year. And as I understand it, you're both interested in ophthalmology. It's a little early in the career, but it can't be too early, I suppose. Um, and I just wanted to mention Shiv is a poker player. He does super well, makes tons of money on the outside. <laughs> And Brennan is a basketball fan and rides motorcycles. Okay, guys, so welcome to the channel, Einstein's Eyes. We're thrilled to have you. And tell us about life as a first year medical student. Uh, and then John and I will just jump in and ask questions, just kind of fill in the, the story gaps, but uh, take it away. Yeah. Uh, you want me to start? You start? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. So, um, I'll tell you, coming into medical school, I had no idea really what to expect, um, both from like a, um, a workload point of view and kind of like a peer point of view, um, you know, as a kid or even as applying, you, you know, you don't see yourself hitting that level and you're like, I have no idea what to expect. Um, and then coming in, you know, it, it felt pretty cozy from the start. And um, I don't know if it's because if it's a new school or the people that I'm around, but um, at, at least from the start, it just felt great being um, a part of the school. Um, and I think half of it had to do with it growing, like as we're going through it, the school is also growing and it's learning how to be run as a medical school. Um, and as far from, you know, student point of view, without getting into the books and the studying, um, just, it's been great. I've, I've had nothing but good things to say about school so far. And, um, Shiv could probably talk more about that too. It's just a great time. Right. To kind of snowball off of what Brennan was saying that like in the school growing with us, uh, it's nice that there isn't really anything concrete as terms of how things are done around the school. So if a student comes with a new perspective or, you know, there's some way that our class feels like we should be taught in a certain way, the school is very accommodating in that. And so that's a nice aspect to, you know, having just started medical school and not really knowing. And even for some students, it's difficult to transition from undergrad education into medical school. Um, I can, you know, give a a little bit into that as well. It was difficult for me initially. And then I think the school being very understanding and accommodating and that has made that transition easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really feels guys, partnership. Do you guys have online classes or is it all in person or? How's all that in work? person. Yeah, yeah, all in person. Um, if there's a snow day or two, yeah. then, you know, but yeah. But, but it's traditional. And then, I, I mean, I've heard different things. Like when we went to medical school, I mean, I went to a semi-med program, but still, Back then, it was traditional. The first two years was classes, you know, basic sciences. And then the third and fourth year was rotations and clinical. Someone was telling me recently that a lot of the med schools are doing it kind of in a different order. Is that the way you guys are doing it or is it more traditional? Yeah, I'd say um, we're along that trajectory as well. Maybe not the two years and two years. We actually have a unique curriculum where technically every single student that matriculates in with us will finish the curriculum within three years um, and kind of give you that 
our school has this three plus one type curriculum in which the last year you kind of have the liberty to either go into residency a year early or complete a master's degree or take a research year before applying to residency. Mm -hmm. So does that mean wow. you, you have one year of rotation? So you like, like I remember just, I guess we had these absolute rotations like general surgery, internal medicine, OBGYN, and then we had electives our last year. Does that mean you're not, you're doing that in the first two years or how are you, how are you able to do enough rotations? Yeah, so it's it's actually funny. Our like didactics, instead of it being two years, it's I think uh, eighteen months, right? I think that's uh, I see. yeah. So they shorten the didactic, so it's like let's say a year and a half, and then they do a year and a half of the rotations. Um, and if yeah, you stay, if, yeah, if you stay within the Hackensack network, that's like the cool thing. They'll funnel you the third year right into residency in Hackensack. Um, wow. And then the fourth year, you can do advanced rotations. So you get your basics and then you can go into depth um, and you can get, like Shiv said, the master's in like business, public health, research, whatever it is, you know, you want to do. Wow, that's really interesting. Because, yeah. you know, to run a practice, I mean, I suppose that fewer and fewer medical school graduates and residents are going into private practice. But those who do in, you know, now looking back, I think John will agree, you do need to understand uh, how to run a business you need to understand finance a bit of accounting a bit of law negotiations uh those types of things because you are running a small business um so uh shiv just to springboard off of what you said earlier though can you tell me about your path to hackensack what how'd you get there why did why'd you choose hackensack why'd you why'd you choose medicine what 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 got you going Right. So um, loaded question, but I'll, I'll try to pick it apart as as you asked. Uh, well, I'd say my route to Hackensack is um, I grew up in Jersey City um, and I still currently reside in Jersey City. Hackensack is just 20 minutes away. So uh, a great driving factor in my decision process after getting um, my acceptances to medical school was the fact that I'd be very close to home, very close to my social support. And so that was a, a big reason as to why I decided um, on Hackensack. Um, but in medicine in general, I think my interest in it really stemmed from, I think, high school biology. And um, I think this is a very like anecdotal reason, but uh, it's kind of what, comp what compounded on this initial interest, which made me want to do medicine. Uh, we were learning muscular contractions, and I think just the biochemical mechanisms underlying it, and then that turning into some greater macroscopic effect was really what intrigued me, and then kind of learning more and more, and then majored in cell biology and neuroscience at Rutgers. And so that's kind of my entire undergraduate education was dealing with these kinds of mechanisms. And that's kind of where I fell in love with the idea that I could, you know, give somebody some sort of medicine that works at a level that we can't see with the naked eye and have them, you know, treat whatever uh, disease that they're, they're dealing with. Sounds great. Brennan, what about you? Yeah. So mine's a, uh, mine's a little weird. Um, my, so my father was a physician um, and he was a cardiologist. And my mother, ever since I was growing up, was like, you got to be a doctor. You got to be a doctor. I said, mom, no, I don't, I don't want to do it. Get it away from me. You know, that's my dad's thing, right? Let him get the spotlight. And I think um, came to maybe my junior year of high school. Um, I was taking physics and I was like, I don't like this that much. So, uh, you know, I was, I, I remember sitting there and coming home like, mom, like, you know, I've always been good in the sciences for the most part. Naturally, it just it kind of clicked. Um, and I was like, Mom, like, what what can I do with this? And she's like, you know, you could be a doctor. And then kind of laughed. And I was like, all right, I'll try it. Um, and as I kind of pigeonholed in myself and my own thoughts, I was like, you know what, Brennan, just try it. See if you like it. You know, no shame. I just really took it in as a whole and started liking every aspect of it. I like what really turned me on is like kind of the sounds weird, like the challenge of learning it. I like being kind of stimulated in that sense. And um, all those classes, I know should can relate in college that, you know, they're, they get you thinking a little differently. Um, and obviously now until medical school in the future, same way. And I really like that. Um, so I, I kind of like that type of environment. And that's what medicine was able to give me or is currently able to give me. Um, and then on a side note, I thought it'd be really cool to work with my hands in some way. You know, I talk to shit about all the time. I'd love to do surgery. And like, that's like an awesome thing that medicine has that not a lot of other people can do. Right. And, um, that's kind of what those two factors are what guided me into medicine. So, 
Yeah. That's great. So, so guys, let's start with Shiv. So what's a typical day or week like for you? So let's say we're, this is a Sunday night and we have lecture, let's say Monday morning. Um, so before we're going to bed, like I'll do, we have, um, I'm not sure if you guys have had this as well, but Brendan could speak a little bit on this as well, that we have textbook readings that are assigned to us prior to the day's lecture. So on a Sunday, I'll, before going to sleep, I'll watch like an hour's worth of videos just to prepare myself for lecture the next day. Um, I'll wake up maybe around 6.20, get ready, and then leave for school around 7.20. It's a 20 minute drive from Jersey City on, on a good day. Uh, but I mean, I'm sure if you guys are familiar with the location, there's no there's no predicting what traffic patterns might be. So uh Brandon knows because we're on we're in the same group chat together that a lot of times it's it's tough to, to get into school on time, but do my best. Um and then school usually runs from our lectures are usually between eight to twelve thirty, eight to one, I'd say, uh, on a on a normal day. And um right after that I make it a habit to um go to the gym on the way home. It's nice that the gym is uh the, the exit right before mine. And so I have to pass the gym exit in order to get to my house. So I'll feel guilt if I don't go to the gym. And so that's a nice way to make that a non-negotiable in my life and kind of give that's kind of my escape from the busy schedule, you know, of a of a medical student. And then I'll, let, I'll work out for an hour and a half, go home, have dinner with my family. Um, so around that time, it's maybe like three, four, and then I'll study until maybe like nine. And then, you know, just do my night routine and go to bed so I could get up and do it the same thing the next day. So you're really doing like four hours, four hours of work a day. I mean, that's, is that kind of your goal? Yeah, I think um, like if you're like, the as Brennan mentioned earlier, we have a really um, accelerated uh, didactic period. So instead of the general two years that you get, we're expected to learn everything uh, that will prepare us for our step exams in uh, I think 16 months is the is the number. And so um, just because we're getting, you know, I think much more content, it takes a lot more time throughout the day to review that material. I don't remember, you know, honestly, how, how many hours I spent. You know, that's why I'm, it's kind of interesting to hear. I'm sure I studied very hard. I don't remember it that well. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't but study. I <laughs> just felt it out. I just won it the whole thing. Yeah. Just yeah. Right. My eyes. Yeah. Day, I, think. I just closed my eyes. Yeah. For the exam. So, Brennan, what <laughs> so, about so, you? Wait, so one yeah. question I have to give is that, so it's very regimented. I mean, pretty much you read, you're going, you're always looking ahead and you're also reading on the stuff you learned that day, I guess. It's, do, do you feel like, I mean, I sometimes just feel like being in class for four or five hours was not as worthwhile as it could have been if I just went and learned it myself. Do you ever feel like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think every lecture is a great lecture, right? Um, there's a lot of times where you'd, you'd be sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, like, if I had given myself maybe 30 minutes outside of this, I probably could have learned it within the time, like, within that, like, two hour allotted period, right? So a lot of times lectures do kind of feel like a waste of time. Um, but then other times there's somebody who comes in really, really passionate about what they're teaching. And, you know, that energy is contagious. And you're able to just, I think, the way they teach it to you is the the same way like a, a kindergarten could understand. And so like right. those are definitely a lot more worthwhile. Well, I mean, I could tie it, John, I think you and I would feel the same way about this, but I think that the Krebs cycle is something that I use every day. <laughs> <laughs> How much ATP? <laughs> no. I'm, I'm very proud that I remember the word Krebs cycle. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I think, I think that, that was fundamentally I think the most important. School is, from my perspective, it was a lot about learning to think and learning to absorb a lot of information and be able to understand it. I mean, that's that's really what the challenge is. And whether you're learning about the Krebs cycle or something else, it really wouldn't even matter at that point. Uh, but yeah, so what about you, Brendan? What's your yeah, week on? I mean, Shiv, uh, for the most part, that's kind of what my week looks like, uh, too. Um, first thing I do, though, instead of going to the gym first, usually I get home and I try to get all my studying done right away. So again, you know, eight to 12 ish um, Sunday, I guess I'll, let me do the same order he did. So Sundays, pretty much the same thing. Um, I spend early half of the day reviewing kind of the past week's material, kind of letting it all sink in, doing questions, or flashcards or looking at my notes, whatever it is. Um, and then later half of the afternoon, I'll prepare for the Monday lectures. So um, the preparing ahead is pretty much every day. So if it's Monday, I look at Tuesday, 
Tuesday, I look at Thursday because we'll probably get into our Wednesdays. Our Wednesdays are a little different um, from what a traditional medical school should be. Um, so yeah, get out, let's say 1230, I come home, eat lunch. Um, and then I just get right to kind of reviewing for the day. Um, I'm least productive between like four and six. So maybe I'll go play basketball or I'll go to the gym. Um, and then when I come home, I'll shower and then I'll do my work for the next day, which usually, you know, along with shit doesn't take too long the next day stuff. Cause it's kind of like an intro. Um, yeah. you could always dive really deep and make it instead of one hour video, like three hours of videos, but if you don't have time, it's not a big deal. You just do it tomorrow. So when um, you say videos, both of you guys said you're prepped for the next day. You're looking at videos. So you're not reading books. You're reading videos about what you're going to learn the next day. Yeah. So it, it depends. Sometimes, um, you know, one little caveat is a lot of the, our professors, you know, super smart, you know, practicing physicians and surgeons and doc, like they're great. A lot of the articles they give us to prep for classes and, you know, it's not their fault. It, they're pretty advanced. You know, it's more like a clinician level, which we still kind of need the basics. We need the you know fundamentals, the pathophys, getting to know it. Um, and that's what like a lot of these YouTube videos or third party programs help us students kind of puts it into a different perspective. Um, and then after we watch those videos, we're able to kind of pick apart that writing in a different um, frame. Very interesting. Yeah. 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 They're really cool. And again, like Shiv said, you know, it, you know, the smarter you get, the you you know, you want to be taught like a kindergartner again. And those videos help dumb it down. And then you can kind of build it back up in a in a more intelligent way. Well, the videos that you access, I mean, you all are watching the same videos, like your school provides them for you, or like you're kind of just going on the online and looking for a video about the Krebs cycle or something. Like how, how are you finding those things? So um both. So sometimes the schools give us videos, like they link them. Sometimes we have to find them on our own. Like let's say use the Krebs cycle, you know, youtube.com. Um, you know, pump in like Krebs cycle and then see there's a lot of like uh, repeat YouTubers that are, you know, famous for the medical field. Like um, oh, Khan Academy is pretty big. Um, there's this one guy, Ninja Nerd, I think he's like huge and he's, yeah, he was a physician uh, or is a physician. And then the other one, and that's why medical school, you know, to add on to the expenses, unfortunately, uh, they have a lot of board material that is board prep that are board certified videos that get you ready for the step exams. Um, and a lot of us students like to watch those early. Uh, so a lot of that stuff is what we watch. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's great. I think it's so much, it's so much better than what we have. That's absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. What did you guys use? Was it all textbook or? It's just, well, it's I mean, the one thing I wanted to ask you though, is, I mean, well, yeah, definitely textbooks. And we read the textbook. It was brutal and it was really boring and it was not well written. A lot of them. But the other thing was that I did like, at least in my school, I don't know about Carl, was that we had really good uh, note groups. So like, I mean, back then technology wasn't what it is now. I don't know what you guys have, but for us, like one guy would bring his recorder to class and then he would write, he would basically put down the notes from that class and then disseminate it in your group and then you would rotate. So in a way, I didn't really want to be in school a lot of times. I have to admit, like I wanted to just read the notes because mm -hmm. I could read the notes much quicker than this guy could talk. Um, I mean, I've seen now these videos that people could do and they could speed them up. I would have loved that. You know, like, I think that's me. I'm just always like on that New York um, pace. So like, I'm like, oh, this guy's talking too slow. And he, I can learn this in half the it's, time. It's so funny so, you say that because yeah. really quick, sorry, yeah. just two times yeah. speed. No, I want to hear, I want to hear your perspective. So we always joke with each other, like, you know, our family members, at least I do, you know, everyone's talking yeah. at a normal pace and living in the life of medical student right now, everything's like two times speed. So I'll watch an hour video in 30 minutes and it's like, blah, 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 blah. And I like process it. But then when somebody's talking, I don't know if Shiv can relate to this at a normal pace. I'm like, dude, speed it up, man. Like, come on, <laughs> like, come on. It's hard. It's, it's really weird. Yeah, I've recently I've gotten into watching Netflix uh, movies and, and TV shows at one point two five speed just because yeah, that's I'm like, crazy. Right, I'm let's get to the end of it. <laughs> yeah. guys, I didn't guys. know this existed until maybe six months ago. I started doing that. I loved yeah. it. That's yeah. funny. That's funny. Uh, so, so do you guys tape the lectures though? Like, do you have, do your professors the lecture that you listen to that they already give it to you? I mean, or do you have to tape it yourself? Or how does that work? So they're all pre-recorded. I think um, I, like every single lecture that we have, they have like a Zoom call going on um, while the, there's a presenter presenting at the at the podium and the entire lecture is recorded. And then we also have mics on each and every one of our tables. So if a student were to ask a question that gets picked up by the mic and then that also gets incorporated into our like lecture video. So if you decide to go rewatch it, let's say closer to exam period, you're able to even get that like dialogue between student wow. and, and professor. 
But can you can you um, do you have software that'll convert that into something written if you wanted to, like if you didn't want to listen to it again and you didn't want to take notes, will that convert it into written notes for you? Oh, right. Like get a transcript of the yeah. actual yeah, lecture exactly. itself. Do they um, give you a transcript or can you get one? I don't know if Zoom auto produces transcripts. Um, if they did, then that would be, I think, our way of doing so. But I feel like if you were to play the lecture out loud on another device loud enough, then any like dictation uh, software would be able to pick that up and kind of just put I it see. out for you. You could do it yourself anyway. Like even when you're not in the room, if you just wanted to have notes from the day without taking notes, you could just get home, turn the Zoom on, have it write notes for you and you, you could you could rely on those notes, yeah. right? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, it's so much better than what we, right? I mean, it's, I mean, the only negative I would think is it's just very, it can be very passive. You have to be, you have to be involved, I guess. And everyone learns a different way. So, right. so guys, so this is for uh, the college students that are interested in medicine. What's the biggest surprise about medical school so far? Shiv, you're up. Yeah, um, I think, I think you can't really study Oh, I mean, at least uh, I'll give my 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 experience. Um, I I couldn't carry the way I studied for exams in college into medical school, and so here's a little bit about how I used to study in college. Um, I'd always attend lecture and I'd take notes during lecture, um, and then I'd do the assignments for whatever lecture that I had. So let's say I did or I was taking organic chemistry, and we had four weeks of material before our monthly exam. I would prepare myself for lecture, go to lecture take down whatever notes I needed. And then we had an assignment or a quiz at the end of the week. That's what I would do. But then when week two would come about, I wouldn't review week one material. I would just worry about week two. And then when week three came, worry about week three, week four came, worry about week four. And then let's say my exam was on the Friday at the end of the week, I would count back four days because I had four weeks worth of material to cover. And then I would do week one, week two, week three, and week four. What I realize now in, in medical school is that the amount of volume, there's just a volume of material that we're expected to have on command for these exams and the detail and depth to which we need to understand it is so much that if you aren't constantly reinforcing what you learned, um, then it's very easy to forget everything. And so let's say things that I'm doing during week one now in medical school, I review during week one and week two and week three and week four. And then things I did during week two, I review during week two, week three and week four. And then that way, I'm not forgetting things that I learned earlier because when my exam prep comes around and I'm I'm tracing back those four days, that first day that I start, had I not reinforced everything I learned during week one, I probably would not have been as confident in like going forward with that material. So um, I know Brennan loves this this software that we use as well called Anki. Oh. Um, it's kind of like a, a flashcard um, software yes. in which they I'm preset sure. your... Um, your intervals in which you will see every each and every one of these cards. And so it kind of facilitates that that process of constantly reinforcing the material that you've been learning. Mm -hmm. So it creates flashcards for you? So we, you have the ability to create your own flashcards. Um, something nice at our school is that previous students of um, previous cohorts had already made cards specific to our classes lectures. And That's then right. like Brendan had mentioned earlier, all of these third party um resources that kind of do board material prep also have their own Anki cards. And so what we do like prior to, you know, a course starting. So we just finished our last course, um, the developing human, and we start homeostasis and allostasis um, after our break, which is next week on Monday. What students will typically do is download the deck that the school made. And then also we already have from previous uh, classes, the the decks from all of the third party resources. And so as you go to lecture, you kind of figure out what you need to know. And then you'll take those cards from the third party resources and from the school one. And then that's what you start practicing. So we kind of, we're lucky in that we've saved the time and that you don't have to make your own cards. These cards already exist yeah, and you're just kind of sorting through them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Brandon, what about you? Yeah. So, um, you know, I agree with the, the flashcard thing. I think the flashcard thing is great. Um, Anki has been uh, wonderful. I know uh, for kids uh, or students that may consider um, going into medicine, some students do use it for the MCAT as well. Um, not to the extent uh, of medical students, but they use it. But um, the main thing, Anki aside, that has changed for me is now I get a lot of my work done before class. Um, so, you know, everyone, our school specifically, they, they have us buy into this whole, like they call it pre-work thing. Um, 
And, you know, I think the takeaway is it doesn't have to be their pre-work, like their assigned readings. As long as you do something um, before class, I think for me, at least it's helped shape my learning. You know, now in class, I'm not taking notes. I'm not listening. I, I'm not like uh, fighting for scraps to try and hear what the professor's saying. I kind of sit back and I just listen. Um, and then I, if I look at my notes, if I, if they say something, you know, just random, I'll pick it up by ear. I'll make a little note on it, but it's not like I have to keep up and, you know, ask my buddy, Hey, what did he just say? You know, it's kind of all there, um, which I didn't do in college. Like Shiv said, you, you would practice, you would do the week's material, maybe do an assignment or two, um, and then forget about it until your final came. Um, which now, um, again, to reiterate, you can't really do. Um, or if you do try to do it, your last week is hell, you know, like you're really, um, screwed per se, because it's just so much, um, and probably like this in a, in a quote unquote, regular medical school too, but even more in an advanced, um, curriculum school that it's, it's hard to keep up. Um, and then, so yeah, I'd say that's my biggest thing, getting most of the work done before coming into class. It helps frame it. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. So. Yeah, you know, I know that you've only been there for uh, this is your first year, but do you have any memorable experiences from from school to date? <laughs> um, yeah, Shiv, you should go first. I don't know. Yeah. Um. Here, let me let me think. <laughs> yeah, so, that's. A good I remember. One. I remember this girl I met. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> In between was, studying uh, the Krebs cycle, her name was uh, Darla. <laughs> <laughs> Darla, if you're still out there. I'm married, sorry. All right. <laughs> I can guarantee she's not looking for you, Jim. <laughs> You're damn right, Carl. Um, I got a good one, actually. I'll go, I'll go first. I mean, I think this is, it's a pretty early memory, but fun nonetheless. Um, one of the first, the first two weeks of medical school are like a, they're not um, study weeks, I guess. It's kind of like, here's the curriculum. Here's why our school's different. Get to know each other, right? But at the end of those two weeks, they have a cruise around New York City, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, cool, And it's, you know, open bar. It's fun. You get to, like, see some of the professors, your classmates say, like, hey, you know, come have a drink. Like, let's hang out. And that's where you kind of start to build that um, initial kind of priming step of seeing, like, these are the people I'm going to spend my, you know, three, four years with. Um, I think that was a fun night. It, it was kind of the first moment where I was like, you know what, medical school, they're not just like nerds. Like these are actual, you know, people like they're cool people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And coming into school, I didn't, you know, it's a child's point of view. You don't, you don't think that they're going to be like you, you know, and um, they are. And that was really cool. Yeah. I remember having a conversation with my brother before coming to medical school. And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to walk into medical school and not really have many friends. I think I'm I'm not going to get along with a lot of the people just because uh like some some of the pre med like uh students that uh, that you kind of disliked in college is, are the people in your mind that you think are going to be in medical school. And then I was pleasantly surprised throughout the you know um those first two weeks where we got to know my classmates. And I'm like wow, all of these people are actually pretty genuine, cool people to hang out with. And and um I met Brennan during those uh two weeks, and you now we're good friends. That's great. That's great. Do you feel like when you were pre-med in your in your colleges that it was more cutthroat and more difficult to get along with people in your classes and like in med school it's not as competitive like where everyone's you know like you know I mean everyone's you know you guys are going to do your work you graduate med school obviously there's different um, specialties but for the most part it's different than pre-med where you know probably the guy to your right and the guy to your left is probably not going to med school kind of thing I mean is it different that way or not not per se. I think our school nurtures a, a completely different, uh, you know, like environment. And, and the reason I say that is because our curriculum, uh, at least uh, preclinical is is pass fail and we're not ranked against one another. And so because of that, every student is willing to help another student out. And, you know, especially when it comes to understanding the material, like people are willing to, you know, go out of their way to help help people out. Like we have this one course called HSS, which helps health system sciences and it's really just a an ethics and statistic like medical statistics course and there's two students who go out of their way during exam week to hold a review session for every single student um i could imagine if that we didn't if if our curriculum wasn't pass fail you know preclinical those types of sessions wouldn't exist because why would you want to help someone out if they're going to be your competition yeah. right so i think if you were to ask another school who doesn't have the same format I think the answer would vary, but at least in our environment, I think it's different. I um I agree. I think compared to the the I guess pre med track in college, I remember 
being very, um, I guess, not for lack of word, you know, lack of better words, like disappointed, right? Not that Seton Hall or Rutgers or any of these schools have bad programs, but the people, you know, they're uncertain, just like myself. Um, they don't know if they're going to get into medical school or not, and they have to be the best uh, to stand out. Um, I never had that type of personality just personally where I was like, I'm going to make sure you don't get in. It's like, I'm going to do my work. I think I'll get in. I'll be fine. If you need help, I'm one of those, like I learned by teaching. So it was easy for me to yeah. say, sure, I'll help you, you know, cause it'll, it's benefiting me. But um, I don't know if Shiv can relate. College was a little brutal. I remember even something simple, like, Hey, you know, I'm studying for the MCAT. This section's a little rough. Like, did you do this practice test? Can you help me out? And they're like, sure, sure. And then they never reach out. And even if you reach them out, they just leave you alone, you know? Um, and, uh, I, you know, coming into medical school, I thought it was going to be like that. It's really not, at least not at our school. And that's, that's kind of what I like about it. It's very family style. I'd so, say like a, advice to a, an undergraduate student who's kind of sharing the same um, experiences that, that Brendan and I did, you know, about kind of reaching out to somebody and not getting help is, is talking to someone who's already done it. Like if you're talking to a first year medical student, they understand everything that you're going through or a second year medical student because they were in that in your shoes like not too long ago. And they understand that everyone maybe who's the same year as you and applying to medical school is not as willing to help out. But um, I felt at least in our school that anytime I reach out to an upperclassman, they're more than willing to help me out because they know one, you're not in direct competition with them. So that's, a you know, they, they wouldn't try to, you know, withhold information and they're also just, you know, I feel like when, once you've experienced that already, you're just more willing to help the next person out. Very great. So guys, what, what's your plans? What, what do you see yourself doing after med school? I guess I'll go, um, hopefully residency, right? So, <laughs> um, I, you know, I really didn't know what field I wanted to go into, um, per se. Um, I finished college up a little bit early. I finished a year ahead. So in that kind of fourth year, what would be my senior year, that's when I started working at the retina center. Um, and I just loved it. I mean, I don't, I don't know if it was the people or the specialty or just ophthalmology as a whole. I thought like, this is really cool because it's such a small organ um, and it's a whole world inside. And I was like, this is, that's cool. You know, I never saw myself being the doctor that's um, that knows everything like about, you know, like, let's say like a primary care where they're just like, master at it, you know, everything. Um, and then when I saw this field, I was like, okay, you got to be really good at one thing. I was like, this is kind of my little niche. Um, yeah. at least from, was, I don't know, you guys can attest that. I don't know. I, that's how I see it. Um, and I think it's really cool. And so yeah. hopefully I'd like to do ophthalmology. I'd, I'd want to get into a residency around here. Um, again, from Jersey, I'd, I'd like to stay in Jersey and kind of be like a hometown hero kind of thing where it's like, I'm with my mother and with my grandmother and I can just, you know, help them out. And, uh, and yeah, and then Dr. Dickoff, Dr. Angeletti, all the, you know, doctors at the Renaissance centers have been great influences on that. And, you know, five questions, they helped me out. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I see, hopefully. Yeah. Shit, what about you? Yeah, I, I think more or less the same plan. Everyone who at least enters medical school hopes to, you know, do some sort of residency to become a practicing physician. So um, that is definitely, you know, the number one goal after graduating. Um, and yeah, I, I also share a similar interest in ophthalmology, um, though, as you guys had mentioned, it's it's pretty early to have like, you know, definitive, this is what I want to do. Um, but I've had some nice experiences in shadowing an ophthalmologist. And I, I do think I like the idea of being able to work with my hands and, you know, being a master of, of one organ and, and being able to do things procedurally. Um, so hopefully a residency in ophthalmology um, nearby, which is kind of been the theme too for me, you know, born and raised and still living in Jersey City. Um, all my schooling has been within Jersey. So I really do have, a, you know, strong ties to the state and I do hope to practice within New Jersey. And yeah. Do you think, um, I mean, you think you guys are going to, what are you going to do with your fourth year? Do you have any feeling right now if you had to guess um do you think you'll do i mean a master's do you think you'll do just a clinical year of to help you get into residency or do you think you'll just try to get into residency right after three years so um for me at least um i, I would like to get a master's in business that year or school does offer it um just either if i you know it managed to you know buy into a practice or run one with someone or start my own. I'd kind of like that background and just how to run something. I don't think they really teach it that well um, in like a medical school curriculum. So having you know even something as simple as like like how how do 
physicians get paid from insurance, like reimbursement. We have no idea, right? So like something that would be able to like guide us in a business aspect in a place of a physician. I think that that's kind of what I want to focus on my fourth year. Um, obviously do research. I'd like to, you know, with all that time, I'd like to do a clinical project um, versus like a written, you know, uh, case studies or meta-analyses. I want to do something more substantial. Um, maybe just travel a little bit, you know, you know, as you know, a little bit if I can, I know life really picks up in residency. So just be able to balance my life for that fourth year. Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. What about Actually, you? I think play, just playing it by the year, really. Um, I know ophthalmology is a really tough, you know, field to go into. And so you need to really stack your resume. And so I think by the time my third year comes around, I'll really be able to gauge where I'm at as far as, um, you know, uh, like if I'm prepared to take, you know, if, if I could just focus on research maybe, or if I'm ready to under, undertake a master's degree, right? Um, I think by my third year, I'd be able to understand that. But in an ideal world, I'd love to also get a master's because um, even though we're de technically done with our curriculum in three, we're still required to pay tuition for the fourth. And so uh, I think to get the most bang for your buck, it's, it's definitely getting a master's degree. Um, and then also, you know, making sure that my research resume is also there so that I'm competitive amongst other people applying for ophthalmology. And yes, yeah, so similarly, just want to travel too. I don't know how tough resident life is going to be on that. I understand you get days off, but I mean, I don't know. When they so in the three years that you're there, it's all pass fail, or is there are there parts that are not pass fail? So um, the the didactic. Um, and then when you start, I think should correct me if I'm wrong, just like the clinicals, I think there's like, I think it's pass, high pass honors. Is that like the yeah. scale? And that's yeah. when you start to get your rank. So obviously I think there's fail, there's pass, high, whatever, but. It's based more uh, on your clinical than on your basic science. Yeah. Yes. And Sorry. even then, when we start getting ranked during our, our clinical period, I don't think we're ranked like one, two, three, four throughout, you know, like, it's not like a, a numerical grading like that. It's more, I think it's quint, like quintuplets or quint you're not yeah not quartiles but the one above that quintiles yeah quintiles yeah yep. yeah john how how'd it work for you so you know i went to a semi-med program out of high school and while i was in my freshman year of college i was 18 years old i was taking english 101 which you know you had to take it's prerequisite to get through college while i was taking anatomy like medical school anatomy so I had a very unique pro program. There's really no programs in the country that are like that, where you are taking medical school classes while you're taking undergrad. And um, for me, grades, we had grades, but they really, for me at least, I didn't really think too much about them. Like, you know, in high school, I was really driven to be ranked top of my class, get all A pluses. And, but in med school, it was like, if I got a B or I got an A or I got, I don't even know if I got any Cs, but I don't remember, it didn't matter to me. Um, some of the guys really did care more. Uh, and then what would happen is in your fourth, in your fourth year of the program, we matched with one of eight med schools. So probably in, I didn't care enough because I, I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't really think about, I was 18 years old. I wasn't thinking about what kind of specialist I wanted to be or where, which school I wanted to go to. They were all amazing schools in New York state. So I, I didn't really care that much. So I got through them. I got through my first three years pretty much with that in mind. And then my fourth and fifth year, I started thinking, hey, you know, let's say I really want to do something that's competitive. So I started to actually work a little harder to get A's uh, instead of B's, but it didn't really matter at that point. I already knew where I was um, going to my, my sixth and seventh year. And then for us, sixth and seventh year was exactly what you said. It was, I was at upstate medical school. It was pass, fail, or honors. That was it. And um, so when I applied for ophthalmology, I was very fortunate because the residencies would look at me and they're like, we don't understand where you went to school. Like, what is this? And I would say, well, I went to a seven-year med program. I was a very good student in high school. And I had to, you know, explain that to them. And they'd say, but really my main focus was my clinical. And I got all honors that year. So that's how I got into ophthalmology. It, my grades and my basic sciences were not necessarily very good. I did really well on the, on the standardized tests. So it's kind of interesting the way you're saying it. I, I would have liked that better. I think clinical is everything. I, I think when you're being judged during rotations, it's not just rotations. A lot of people think, oh, you know, it's 
how well you do in the clinic. That's not true. You're taking a test at the end of each of those rotations. That's really hard while you're working in the hospital every day along with residents. So I, I think that is a good way to be evaluated. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, so you guys are really going to be, that's where you guys might end up being a little more cutthroat. Right. Yeah. 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 So, but, but guys, John's being humble because at, at oh. Einstein, they used to whisper the name Dickoff. <laughs> he was so smart. He was so smart. He was, they were afraid to speak his name out loud. <laughs> Not even true. Yeah. So <laughs> I had who knew I had come and I, Carl I mean, went Carl went to a really good college. He went to Amherst. <laughs> and he was he was that guy. And then he was the research guy. He was, yeah, oh, yeah, was yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was a research guy. I was a research guy. But the reason I went to Einstein, and I, I basically applied to one ophthalmology program. <laughs> it was and Ron Bird just liked me, you know, because I, I, I was at Einstein. I was at Einstein. Yeah. So I was, an, I was an intern at Einstein and I walked in when I was an intern, I just interviewed. And I remember sitting in, in the, in the waiting room with all these kids that were super intense and they were applying to 25 programs and I applied to one program. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes though. Just one. That's it. It just takes one. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to go off the handle but here, I but think I think it's really good the way, I mean, if I was making a med school, it's really tough. Like, because I get that they're specialties and I get that they have to base it on something, but really at the end of the day, you really want people to learn and be comfortable and be challenged. Um, but the hard part is, you know, there's competitive residencies. How are they going to decide who should be working there? It's really tough. Yeah, it is tough. I mean, so I would say mentor, you, you got to get a mentor that's in a good position to write a recommendation for you. But guys, uh, this has been great. Yeah. To wrap this up though. What I'd like to ask each of you, uh, Shiv and Brennan, is where do you see, what are your thoughts on the future of healthcare and medicine? I mean, given that ChatGPT is around, 4.0, 5.0 is coming. You know, there's this new book by Kahane and Goldberg about AI and healthcare and, you know, artificial intelligence doing a better job than doctors. Where do you think it's it's going? What What's it going to be like when you graduate? I think at least um, so I, I I know this this topic is really pertinent in, in the field like radiology and um, I think like uh, that telemedicine and uh, that for that matter too but um, specifically in terms of radiology is where I've been reading into it a bunch more. Um, I think physicians who are able to use artificial intelligence to their advantage will maybe outcompete a physician who's not capable of using artificial intelligence by the time that Brennan and I are ready to be become practicing. Um, I don't think there, I, I mean, unless, you know, there's like six significant technological advancements by the time we become physicians that, you know, they're capable of completely diagnosing something um, that a, a human couldn't, right? Like or with greater efficiency, that it would be able to completely replace the need for a human physician. Um, I think people who are well-versed in artificial intelligence are able to use that to their advantage would maybe have a selective advantage over, you know, another physician who isn't. Um, this, this is what I think. Good, good. Is there a specialty that you wouldn't do because you're concerned that AI is going to just make it that you're not going to have a job or is like, it's not, you don't think it's like that. Well, I think, um, so uh, initially coming into medical school, I was interested in radiology and I know there's two branches of it now. There's diagnostic and interventional. Um, and for diagnostic radiology, I, I think there, like in, in any image, let's say you were to get an MRI or an X-ray, there's a degree of artifact that I think a artificial intelligence algorithm will pick up on um, and maybe misdiagnose something. And I think that with refinement and in putting enough data sets, like a artificial intelligence algorithm will be able to be able to pick apart an actual diagnosis from artifact but ultimately i think there's something that comes with experience and seeing things on images enough times that'll give a human the advantage over an artificial intelligence algorithm for diagnosing something in diagnostic radiology so even that's a field where i feel like that's this is the most pertinent conversation but sure. i still wouldn't like be per se deterred from you know exploring it yeah, so what it kind of where my mind goes to is I think the AI is kind of used as a um what's the word I'm looking for? Let's say an addition where it could be helpful. 
um, either to cross check or to uh, use as an aid, but it should it shouldn't be primarily used as a resource. Like that's not your go to, you know. Um, and I think there's an art to being a diagnostician where you can diagnose and you can pick up on the small little nuances that maybe AI would miss or maybe not. Um, but you really never know uh, with AI. I mean, I think Shiv and I probably both went through this. We'll screw around on ChatGPT, maybe type something and we learn in class. Um, and maybe it'll pull from the wrong source. Um, and that's what you have to be really careful for. If you don't know what you're putting into the ChatGPT or whatever open AI you're using, you don't know what's going to come out and you could take that information whichever way you want. If you don't have a background on it or you're really not sure, I don't think it could be beneficial um, and it could really take you the wrong way. Um, but I think it is one of those things in terms of efficiency, you can be really efficient with AI. Um, and if it's some, if it's a corner that you feel safe cutting, that's where that I think can be integrated. Um, but in regards to the second question, I don't think there's a field that I wouldn't go into because of AI. I'm, I don't think, um, even let's say like a patient, like I wouldn't want AI to take my health, you know, I'd want, I'd want a living, breathing human to, to look out for me. Um, and that doesn't, you know, I don't think that'll change with whichever field. Um, and I think as people become more used to AI, they'll look at it more of a, of a friend, um, or, a, a it's like a better textbook, um, than a competition where it's like, it's going to take my job. I don't think it'll reach that point. I hope not, but <laughs> I don't think so. I think, I think um, I mean, I, you know, I, Carl is much more up on AI than I am. And I think he's much, I, I, my perspective on AI is very similar to yours, where I think my history takers, the people that check vision, I mean, a lot of the things that are done that take time, even just getting their insurance information, all these things that I have a staff doing that do a wonderful job at it. I think AI is going to definitely affect that. I think, you know, people are going to be much more comfortable in talking to, to a machine to give them the insurance. I mean, already some offices are doing that, but not well. I think that's what's got to improve big time. I think clinically, I think it's going to be a long time, but Carl, what do you think? Guys, buckle up, guys. Yeah, that's, Carl's very... Uh, it's coming. Right? I don't think we can stop it. This is a train. But, no, uh, but I think, do you think it's going to replace physicians? I mean, you think it, you're not going to have an ER doctor that's really making a decision on what brought this guy in today? And I think I think look at this patient. You gotta look yeah, at but John, patient. John, I think I think all that stuff, it's just not gonna do it. I think that you two guys as uh first year med students thinking about a surgical subspecialty is the right way to go because you can't replace these still. These this is how you're gonna, you know, uh run your business and make yourself valuable to people and, and to your patients. The diagnostic skills will be uh, performed by a massive data set with you know trillions and trillions of tokens and bits of information, but they still can't replace this. Now, maybe one day they will, but currently I don't think that's coming in the near future. So that's what I would go for. But super exciting times. I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, the one thing I wanted to do, John, unless you got something, is I want to wrap this up, but I would like to ask you both to make a plug for your med school and for potential college students in New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Massachusetts, uh, throw a plug in for Hackensack Meridian Medical School and tell us why it's special and why you're glad you're there. All right. Um, so obviously for everybody in our area, uh, Hackensack, if you know the Has Hackensack Meridian Hospital Network is probably the biggest, uh, you know, network all in New Jersey. Um, even if you're not from Jersey, there's a high likelihood if you could come by, you probably know of it. Um, and if you're looking for, you know, a, an opportunity to work in that network right away and kind of get into a quick Hackensack's really the school to to come to. Um, I think their accelerated program is fantastic. They really focus on it um, and they do a good job in getting their students matched and into um, the specialties that they offer. So that's kind of, that's like the biggest selling point, I think, which is great about the school. Um, and again, I don't want to take too much from Shiv's answer, but also the camaraderie, I think is really good. Um, the pass-fail curriculum is great for students that are are kind of working out the weeds of starting medical school, you know, so somebody's a little weak in the beginning, that's okay because you're not being compared just yet. And you can kind of pick up your feet and pick up your pace as you move on. 
Um, and the camaraderie is there to help you and the teachers are great and it's growing with you. So especially for the next three, four, five years, school's still going to be learning. Um, and you can be a part of that initial push to make it better. So that's, that's what I believe. Yeah, sure. And um, to add a little bit on to what Brendan was saying, um, I think the school really emphasizes and so I know I, Brendan alluded to it a little bit earlier, but our Wednesdays are different. Um, our Wednesdays, we put a, a large emphasis on really being able to refine our clinical skills and really be able to treat every single patient population type that you may encounter in practice. And um, there's a there's a large emphasis in really being able to treat the mind, body, and soul of this patient of the patient, and not kind of just what they're presenting with. And I think that sort of training is invaluable because it'll really be able to differentiate you and how you practice. Um, um, I think just in the short year that we've been in school, I think that has really been able to refine my interpersonal skills. And so if you're really looking to, you know, create long lasting, trusting relationships with your patients, this is a great way and a great training for you to, you know, kind of undergo. And I think that's a unique thing to our school is that and on Wednesdays, we don't have lecture. We actually just focus on these sorts of skills and really being able to refine our ability to connect with a patient and build a very trusting, long-lasting relationship. That's huge. Good for you guys. I bet you didn't John. do that in med school, Carl, right? <laughs> Carl, in your med school, you didn't do that at all, right? Uh, no, so, yeah. So, no, but it's interesting. I mean, my program was stored. It was a New York City-based program. And the concept was exactly that. So we were leaving high school and they wanted to graduate doctors that weren't the typical doctors, kind of like what you're talking about. They didn't care if we took calculus. They didn't care if what we took in college. They wanted us to learn about psychology, behavioral science. The emphasis was on treating the whole person, understanding. They, they had us do rotations where we went as, you know, we were college med schoolers, but we went to inner city and we did uh, and we worked in the inner city with 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 people just to learn about where they you know what the problems they had they couldn't why they couldn't see a doctor why they couldn't have access to healthcare so anyone that graduated my program was a different trained doctor back then most med school med schools were not like that right Carl I mean they were very traditional it's like they didn't they didn't think below you know they, they didn't want you, they didn't want you to think about this stuff right. so that's really nice that's really a big a big you know, plus for you. Really quick, just to add on to that for really quick, we do have something like that. It's called our VP program, which again is like usually like one of those Wednesday things, but um, we are giving a, the VP, what does it stand for again? It's um, Voices Program. Oh yeah, Voices Program. Yeah. So we're giving a, a VP in, in the program and that's pretty much, it's a longitudinal relationship over four years. That's, you know, we can't treat them as doctors, but we can treat everything else. You know, like how is your home life? Are you having trouble with this bill? How is this playing a part into getting to the doctor's office. You know, do you have a car with transport? And we're kind of give it, get, getting that other side of healthcare, which is how are you able to access it? And what are the troubles? You'll be much, you'll be much better uh, residents because of that, let me tell you. Yeah. And doctors, you know, afterwards. Yeah. So, I mean, that just to make a suggestion, Shiv, asking about um, a master's. I mean, the finance part is great. The, the business part is great. But also healthcare policy is really interesting. Uh, that's yeah. another topic that med schools don't dive into, at least when I was around. But again, mine was traditional in Boston. I was at Boston City. And uh, yeah, pretty much very militaristic, hierarchical yeah. by the book. But listen, guys, it was great. I, yeah, think, I think our audience, I think medical students, uh, I mean, college students in particular interested in medicine will find this useful. John, great job as usual. Brennan. Great to have you. you. Good meeting you, Shiv. Likewise. You as well. New Jersey is in good hands. I can safely say yeah. that. All right. So we'll see you on the next one. Thank you, everyone.